Ding 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 I thought you were going to cannon with me there. I don't know. I didn't know what we were doing. Okay, that, I yeah. just thought I'd throw that on you. Hi, Cece. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? I'm good. We are getting close to Christmas. Yes. And we were going to be doing an episode on... La double vie de Véronique. That's right. But we sort of both, I think, called an audible on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know what that means to call an no, audible? No, actually. It's a, it's a football term, like when the quarterback goes up to the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And then he reads the defense. Mm -hmm. And he calls an audible. So he calls a play that is different from what Got the coach it. told him to do. Got it. So we're calling an audible. We're mm -hmm. reading the uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And the environment is Christmas. Yes. And this is for, I think, both of us, a very special Christmas, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Because we were separated from each other. I don't want to get too personal in our mm -hmm. um, podcast well, for the public. Well, actually, I would like to address the fact that personally, and I know that there are a lot of people out there who are like this, and so I would like to sort of address the fact that I have been alone for many years Regardless of my relationship status, I had been alone for Christmas for a really long time. And I think it's because Christmas is such a family-oriented holiday. It's true. Yeah. And so, you know, you could be casually dating someone, but you're not necessarily going to spend Christmas with them unless you're Korean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I spent a lot of Christmases alone. And then last year, we were separated due to the pandemic for the holidays so this is basically my first Christmas as like a family situation. Right. Since like my adolescence, I think. Right. Yeah. And so that's why we decided to kind of be a little bit obnoxious about Christmas. We got a tree, you know. Oh, we're doing, we're going all yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. For me, and I was in Taiwan before I was mm -hmm. separated from you. Mm -hmm. And in general, anyway, Christmas as an expat can be a very lonely thing because yes. you're away from family. Yes. Like Thanksgiving is one thing, and usually, at least in my little community, we get together on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We also do on Christmas, but Christmas, for some reason, is the especially difficult mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And so I think for both of you and me last year, mm -hmm. Christmas was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So we watched the movie White Christmas, mm -hmm. which is, I think, the closest thing we could come to a Christmas movie about music. There's really yes. not that many out there. I noticed this. I even tried to look it up. This was the closest thing that came to a Christmas music. Yeah, movie me too. Event. There are a lot of musicals. Yeah, there's a lot of Christmas musicals, but they're not about music. Exactly. So this one has performance as an element mm -hmm. of the plot. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to do this movie. Mm -hmm. But before we get into the movie, I thought we might talk about some other things about, mm -hmm. I don't know, what's what's been going on musically, what's been going on in mm -hmm. the world a little bit for us personally. We we had a really nice Thanksgiving. We played mm -hmm. some music. Mm -hmm. I, I played a show. Well, it was kind of a jam, actually. And then uh, we were down in Busan, mm -hmm. which is in South Korea, second largest city. And I did a little jam with, with my friends Robert and mm -hmm. Gino. And then you came down and we did this excellent little show at this intimate place called Home Bistro, which is a vegan restaurant. But it also has live music, mm -hmm. kind of low volume live music. Mm -hmm. And that was just super fun. It was magical. For those of you who don't live in Korea, and for those of you who, you know, don't play music in Korea, I feel like, and this is the sort of the general consensus about playing music in Korea that I get from people who have played music outside of Korea. Korean audience, audiences are awesome, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, they get they'll listen really to, they'll, into They'll listen it. to anything you do <laughs> yeah. and love it. They're so excited about live music. Yeah. And I don't know why that is. I mean, it's not a. It's not an expat place. It's a, it's a Korean... There's always, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's a Korean place. It's run mm -hmm. by Koreans. It's run by um, actually a friend of ours. And I'm always interested in the clientele there because a vegan restaurant, the very... Mm -hmm. it, it feels like your parents love that place, right? Everyone that I took to Home Bistro loved Home Bistro. And you guys, the previous night, I wasn't there, but you guys played at Old 55. Old 55, yeah. yeah. Which is now being run by our friend Mike Edmonds. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. that's, that's, it's a legendary music venue. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. where in Busan in Korea, that's where my community really started. Mm -hmm. That's where I met all of the musicians, including Mike and Gino and Robert mm -hmm. and all of these people. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you. Yeah. I met you there. Yeah. 
This yeah. is what we've been missing yeah, all yeah, of this time. Yeah. And so during the pandemic that's ongoing, it's just nice to be able to mm. go back and play music and play music, mm. you know, in a way people appreciate and they enjoy it. And that feeds back to us and we get the joy of playing music. Mm -hmm. And then we had our friend Gino come up and we did mm -hmm. a bunch of music. Yeah, so our friend Gino, who we who is the bass player and sometimes guitar player of the band that we kind of started, I think. Our nascent yeah. reemergence. Right. He him and his girlfriend came to visit us from Busan. While he was here, I was asked to write the lyrics to a Christmas jingle song for a company that everybody knows about that I'm not going to mention. And this happens so frequently in this industry. And I'm asked to do... This is your job, part this of your is, job. Yeah, this is part of my job. Recently, I did the lyrics and I also sang for the commercial of a really major video game that's mm -hmm. coming out. Um, so this is qu sort of the time of the year when these things all sort of happen at the same time. And some of these jobs present themselves as emergencies, meaning mm. I would get a call from some producer at a studio and he'd be like, can you write lyrics for this song within the next hour? Which is basically what mm. happened to me. It's always an emergency. And there's always a reason behind why this was an emergency. Mm. right? And this time it was... They had a major artist that everybody knows of. I'm not, I, I can't say, I can't mention any of these names, whose Christmas song that they were supposed to use, but they couldn't last minute. They couldn't, they couldn't get, get the, the rights. rights yeah. And they wanted me to write a song that was almost identical to the song, but like wouldn't create any issues with co copyright laws, meaning... I'm sure this happens all the time. Oh, yeah. This is how th songs, jingles are written in Korea and possibly in other countries, too. Um, this always happens. Like We want this song to sound as, as similar to this song as possible, but without using any of the words that were used in this song. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so Gino happened to be there, and we kind of wrote this stupid song together, the three of us. Yeah, and I, you guys were working on it. I kind of came out, and I was yeah. throwing in ideas. And we used all of the cliches, like the Christmas cliches that we could think of. <laughs> yeah. And so let's think of the Christmas cr cliches. I'm not saying that this is necessarily the song that we wrote, but there were things like snow. Joy. Joy. Spirit. Sprite. Angels. Angels. Hearts. Yeah, but like love. snow angels. Yeah, yeah. And the Christmas tree underneath the tree. Right. The oh, whole point line. of this story is that we wrote this song that was clearly like the best song that could possibly have been written with those directions. Like it sounded almost exactly like that other song, except that we didn't use any of the words that that song used. Mm -hmm. But then they wanted me to include the word Christmas cake, which is something that doesn't exist in Western countries. This is the interesting thing is they wanted you to say Christmas cake. Yeah, which doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. This is for a Korean audience in English for an American company. Mm -hmm. Wow. You're Also, you're not allowed to say Merry Christmas. Right. You're supposed to say Happy Holidays now. Even in Korea, I guess. Yeah, so the song was just like, happy, happy, happy. We had fun. We, had a, we, we were had laughing fun. our heads off yeah. while writing this song. So I think there's something to be said. This is my conclusion. I think there's something to be said for writing sarcastically and also writing like it within a group. But there's also a sarcastic sincerity. Yes, yes. It has to be sincere, right. but there's an element of sarcasm when you're dealing with commercial jingles and copywriting. Yeah. Right? Right. Well, the other thing I was thinking about, you know, like I, in in my other lifetime, I used mm -hmm. to be a, a, mag or, sorry, yeah. a newspaper writer. Yeah. And in newspaper writing, something happens and you have to push out copy within like the hour. Mm -hmm. Like I worked for a wire service, mm -hmm. um, which means that anybody can lift the story and reproduce mm -hmm. it and use mm -hmm. it in a, in a newspaper. And I was like, I worked in a cubicle and I got the story and then I wrote it as fast as I could. It's mm -hmm. what happens when you're doing the craft of mm -hmm. what people think of as art for commerce. Mm -hmm. the speed becomes the important element. You have mm -hmm. to be able to do it fast, mm -hmm. right? So there was that. We were like, oh shit, we got an hour <laughs> to do this and we and we did it yeah and so we did this at sort of like a micro level i mean i'm a part-time professional songwriter by trade yeah and i feel incredibly stifled this is 
kind of my dream job, but also it's like my dream job that from hell mm -hmm. that's ruining my life and making me really depressed sometimes. Yeah. But I realized as we were watching the Beatles documentary, Get Back yeah. by Peter Jackson, yeah. which is also something that we watched this weekend, that this might happen on different levels of artistry. True. And I realized that they were dealing with their own version of managing and pressure mm -hmm. from like labels and production companies. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, that's basically what the documentary, mm -hmm. what emerged is what the documentary is about, mm -hmm. kind of in a way. Mm -hmm. They had, what, three weeks in order mm -hmm. to write some songs and then put together a show, they were going to make a live album, record a live album out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, three weeks mm -hmm. um, of them in the studio as the band is nearing its end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they have to do this process of mm -hmm. coming up with these songs. Yeah. You know, people are talking about this documentary, it's how the sausage is made. And for some people, they like that. For some people, they don't. Uh -huh. I thought it was really interesting. I'm only... Yes. We were watching it. I think you were completely invested in it uh -huh. for the first two hours, and then I think you fell asleep in hour three. Yes. But I kept watching it, and mm -hmm. I think I've gotten up to the point where they've decided to do the show on the rooftop. I, anyway, I'm mostly done. I've got about an hour and a half left. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's really interesting what being under that pressure mm -hmm. does. And for me, there is, on the one hand, a mystical element to the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And there is, at the same time, a curiosity about what happened. Mm -hmm. So we're getting like a real sense of what was going on there. What mm -hmm. I feel is a real, authentic sense yeah. of what was going on. And it is coming at the sacrifice of this mysticism that, you know, maybe we don't want to know too much about what happened. I don't know how I'm going to feel about this documentary until like six months from now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I'm not sure how this, until I listen to the Beatles again. Mm -hmm. Because for me, the Beatles are this magical band. Mm -hmm. And I think if possible, they are an underrated band. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And to kind of see this happening and see this unfolding is really interesting. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it's kind of a product of this age of wanting to know everything. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We live in an age of wanting you're to know absolutely right. yeah. everything. It's like the reality yeah. TV aspect. Exactly. Yeah. And it is fascinating. Like you were saying how it's just kind of mesmerizing to watch. It's absolutely mesmerizing. If anything, I'm more impressed by them. They seem more like gods to me now. Okay, so it's interesting you say gods mm -hmm. because the thought that came to mind with me, and I posted this as a comment on someone's Facebook, but it's like being a fly on the marble on Mount Olympus. Yes. As mm -hmm. maybe Zeus and Prometheus are having arguments about how to create human beings. Mm, that, it's, it, that's very dramatic. But yes, that is, it's very similar to how I felt. Yeah. Yeah, because it really is like this is, if you think, obviously they're not creating society, they're not creating civilization, mm -hmm. but they are creating the equivalent of the pinnacle of music as we think about popular mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's just really fascinating to watch it unfold. And I have mm -hmm. different opinions about all of them. Mm -hmm. I, I think my, you know, I read Jeff Emmerich's book about the Beatles, which um, was a fantastic book because I'm into audio engineering, mm -hmm. but also he gives a sense of things. His portrait of Paul is pretty much how you see it here. Paul is leading the ship. Oh my God, absolutely he's, leading the ship. He's the manager of the mm -hmm. band. I, I mean, you'd think, obviously not technically, but in terms of the creative process. Well, yeah, and he's like the primary songwriter. I don't know why some of well. Like, I, I would stop you there. I mean, John is coming in with his ideas, but mm, but in terms of the arrangement, so this is sure, a movie yeah. about the arrangement of the songs. Yes. In some cases, we actually mm -hmm. see a song come together on the spot, like mm -hmm. Get Back. Mm -hmm. It was really fascinating to watch mm -hmm. that come together mm -hmm. in the moment. He's like, and then it just kind of comes together, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. But just as the guy who's like, yeah, he's like the, he's the manager of putting these things together. Mm -hmm. And I think about like bands like Fleetwood Mac where Lindsey Buckingham doesn't get songwriting credit for a song like Dreams, which mm -hmm. Stevie Nicks wrote, mm -hmm. but he put the song together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a two chord song she wrote on a piano and she's got great words and a great melody. But in terms of crafting the song, so Lindsey Buckingham, mm -hmm. uh, Paul McCartney, I'm kind of seeing a correlation there. For sure. John Lennon is a loon. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, that guy... He maybe he's bipolar. I don't know. I don't know, but he he's absolutely. I you know I I witnessed his genius. I guess in the documentary, everything he touched was kind of gold, wasn't it? And yeah, and yeah. he's got this brain that just fires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was weird. It was really weird. Yeah. <laughs> and then George comes off as this just dismissive, curmudgeon-y guy, but then at, over the course of the documentary, his personality changes quite mm -hmm. a bit. 
and um, not his personality, but his his attitude changes. Well, quite George a bit. wrote some of my favorite Beatles songs, though. A yeah, couple of my yeah, favorite yeah. Beatles songs, and I always liked Ringo. I mean, I like all of them. You missed a moment. It was actually in the um, the original documentary. It's it's probably the moment I remember most from the original documentary. Mm-hmm. Is Ringo comes in with Octopus's Garden. And he starts playing it on the piano. George Harrison walks in the room mm-hmm. and he basically gives him the B part of the song mm-hmm. <laughs> right there. He's like, oh, try this. And then he does these chords mm-hmm. that completes the mm-hmm. the song. Mm-hmm. George doesn't get any writing credit for that. Mm-hmm. It's a Ringo song mm-hmm. just because Ringo started it. But, you know, it's just I was doing the dishes the other day. I was thinking, like, what is writing a song? Well, it used to be. Very, very clear. I think, like, if anything, the copyright laws were very clear on what constitutes as writing a song. And now it's become much more blurry. And so now, if he had done that now in 2021, he absolutely would have gotten writing credits. That's why nowadays you see, like, 20 people or, like, 50 people on the writing credits of, like, a Beyonce song, for example. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, anybody right, who con- contributed, like, even, like, a woohoo, you know, gets mm-hmm. a writing credit. That's true. Which I don't agree with. Right. But I do think that the person who arranges the song... There should be an arrangement credit, because I know of a lot of songs... Should absolutely get songwriting credit, because yeah. the arrangement is, like, the hardest part of the job. Yeah. I, there's a song in my past mm-hmm. that I feel like I should have gotten... An arrangement credit you for... You probably should have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The song wouldn't have been what it... Mm-hmm. Kind of like the Dreams example, I would mm-hmm. say. But yeah, it's just kind of interesting watching it come together. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. the movie we saw is White Christmas, and I really enjoyed this film. I did too. It was fun. How could you not? I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's a crowd-pleasing film about Christmas. Mm-hmm. It is a movie about music. It's a musical and, yes. And we said that we weren't going to do musicals, but we are sort of amending our... No, but you said that we could do musicals if they are about music. Yeah, so there's these two types of musicals generally. There's the backstage musical mm-hmm. and there's the straight musical. Oh, what are the, the differences? Yeah, so the straight musical is something we would think of as like West Side Story or American in Paris... Okay. Uh, where they're singing and dancing that kind of creates its own imaginative world or this mm-hmm. its own idyllic kind of space of mm-hmm. performance. And then there's the backstage musical where the musical, the music numbers mm-hmm. are given on stage. Got it. Yeah. So there's an element of, you know, artists doing their craft. Yes. I I know exactly what you're talking about. So the straight what straight musicals yeah, the straight are like chicago yeah they burst into song for seemingly no reason yeah exactly yeah. it's like we'd be having a conversation and i'd suddenly be like yeah Jim, yeah, yeah. and there's about? like um like the classic i mean it happens in everyone but i'm thinking of, you've seen have you seen west side story yes of course yeah um so there's the moment when the two rival gangs are dancing mm-hmm. and then the two the the two see each other and you know mm-hmm. it's this romeo and juliet moment mm-hmm. and then the color changes mm-hmm. and all of a sudden everything stops yeah all the action around them stops and they come together and they dance so that's that's the creating the fantasy world within mm, yeah. but then in american in paris you know they're dancing through the streets and every, it's a fantasy basically musicals mm-hmm. straight musicals are fantasies yeah. my favorite type of musical moment is like the the most absurd type of musical movement moments are when like they'd be having a conver- like a normal conversation, right? Like, yeah, Jim. I mean, the movie was amazing, and you know, I had a great time last night. And all of a sudden, you know, I would slip into song within the dialogue. So it's like, right? And then I'm like, yeah, I'm going to song. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and we get up and we start dancing. And then the all streets. of a sudden, it becomes a song. But like, and then they like resume their conversation after the number. <laughs> yeah. So a really like there's a, a really dark example of this is Bjork, Bjork's... Um, oh, I hated that. Uh, what's his name? Dancer in the Dark. Lars von Trier. Yeah, that movie yeah. was so... We were talking earlier today about movies that are traumatizing. Mm-hmm. That movie, I can't watch again. Yeah. She, so that's a straight musical. Okay. Because she's a factory worker, yeah. right? So this movie has elements of both, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, when they break out and start dancing, except there's... You know, it's kind of, there's this, also this idea in film theory of diegetic. Often there's kind of a blurring between the two of what is really happening 
and what is only happening for the audience. Yes. In this movie, when they, Danny Kay, is that his mm-hmm. name? Yes. And Vera Ellen, Ellen. Mm-hmm. they kind of pull away from the restaurant where the performance happened earlier. Oh, yeah. And they, and they start dancing. Dance number. But yeah. then they come back. I think Bing Crosby says, What are you two having your own little moment or something like that? Yeah, yeah. What is this? Uh, best two out of three or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they, it, it's implied that they did do that. They did actually yeah, do this, this yeah. elaborate dance number for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where, you know, film theory kind of folds in on itself mm-hmm. and implodes and it doesn't really matter anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, it is a movie about music because these are four performers. Mm -hmm. You've got the two gentlemen and then the two sisters, and Mm -hmm. they're separate, and they each have their own performance um, group. So I think they're needs to be some sort of like historical context sure in like this type of performance because um i'm not an expert on it but i do know that a lot of what we sing as the american songbook like the the jazz standards that singers sing when they learn how to become jazz singers right um were written during this era mm-hmm. of like you no know, world war one and then world war two um so they had these like cheap-ish vaudeville kind of performances, Mm. right? And it is my understanding that it was for people who couldn't afford to even go to the movie theater, Mm. I think. Mm. Um, Because movies were not as available, Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Production was also very, it was stunted during the war. Mm. Um, So they went to these, I guess, vaudeville shows, right? You're right, actually, yeah. yeah. So these vaudeville shows sort of preceded the musical, and and a lot of the musicals lifted off of that. Yes. You're right. And they usually had this formula of a very cheesy plot that was always the same. Mm -hmm. There's always an ingenue, Mm -hmm. right? Who falls in love with this bad boy, and then? <laughs> yeah, there was a there was kind of in those old vaudeville shows. If I'm remembering my lessons from school, there was kind of a seedy mm-hmm. element to this. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of the, you know, you wouldn't take your kids to a vaudeville. Show. Right, right. And then this kind of like became after I think after one of the wars, world wars. They became more family friendly. And then also like there was, they had to do what they could with low budgets. They had to entertain the soldiers. The shows had to be produced no matter what the budget was. Mm -hmm. So they could have been with like showgirls and costumes and all that Mm -hmm. to anything that they could make that would, you know, just entertain people. Usually like workers, factory workers or, yeah. So it was cheap entertainment. And then this kind of evolved into like, you know, a highbrow sort of like a dinner show kind of thing situation too and i forgot what the the exact historical context of this type of dinner show was but it was basically the very first scene we see was 1946 right no because we're at the war oh that was 1944 i yeah, think yeah. yeah and then the the scene after they get out of the army right so there's bing crosby mm-hmm. and danny Kay. And they were, they were soldiers together yes. in the war. Danny Kay saves Bing Crosby's life. Mm-hmm. And hurts his arm, and not hurts, permanently, but he right. keeps rubbing it in. Yeah, he keeps yeah. rubbing it in. <laughs> and they, they were doing this performance for their general who was mm-hmm. being sent on another um, yes. um, assignment. Yeah. So I think this has to be... It was this type of show is intrinsically related to the two world wars, right? I think wars, so, yeah. Right? yeah. Mm-hmm. This kind of... This culture kind of was born out of the world wars that was my understanding of it mm-hmm. and the, all of this knowledge comes from reading this <laughs> i can't believe i'm saying this i sort of like <laughs> fell in love with elizabeth gilbert's writing and i hate saying this because she's Who's the elizabeth author gilbert? Okay, so she's the author of eat pray love oh god i know you would, I, a lot of people are going to be like <laughs> not listening to cc anymore <laughs> I want a divorce. (laughs) No, but I didn't like Eat, Pray, Love. But I read her most recent novel, which is called City of Girls. And this is entirely, yeah, I I bought it in Taiwan and -hmm. I couldn't stop reading it. Okay. (laughs) And it's about the protagonist is a costume designer for these type of shows. And Mm -hmm. it starts in the 1940s. This uh, No, in the 1930s. The novel starts in the 1930s and then goes on to the 1980s. 
So there is an entire history of the vaudeville, like the, the showgirl kind of thing mm-hmm. that I read. And I found it fascinating because it directly correlates with musical theater, mm-hmm. how it's produced, and also not necessarily jazz, but yeah, jazz and uh, big bands, uh, contemporary music, mm-hmm. and how songs were written and sung. You mm. know, the songs that we call standards, they mm. were all sung, they were all written for very practical purposes. Yeah, it's really interesting how some mm. of these movements come out of situations, you know, unique situations, mm-hmm. um, whether it has to do with, you know, an economic situation or something, or something that starts in the underground and then emerges mm-hmm. and comes to become a dominant form, becomes hybridized in certain ways. You know, like television was a combination of radio and movies, mm-hmm. basically took the model, the sound production model of radio mm-hmm. with the image production model of film and then we got tv yeah yeah so this this vaudeville aspect coming into the musical is is really interesting yeah in the movie that was kind of addressed in an indirect way i think so within the film itself within the film yeah because mm-hmm. danny k approaches bing crosby but by the way bing crosby is obviously bing crosby in the movie like yeah it's bing doing bing just like john yeah. wayne does john wayne it's like okay he's obviously nobody says it but he's obviously the best singer in the world that anybody has ever heard yeah <laughs> as right. soon as he opens his mouth everybody's just like oh my god right but they never address that right but he's the star well, they they yeah. kind of do at the beginning mm-hmm. when uh, in the very in the opening scene mm-hmm. when he says this guy has a great voice mm-hmm. he says that in the very beginning, yeah yeah and then um so danny Kaye's character approaches him with songs that he has written and yeah. he's like yeah let's do this as a double act when we get out right and Bing's like, no, I yeah. do. I work alone. <laughs> yeah, but then they end up doing it, and they end up being very successful. This this movie is actually a series of pronouncements by Bing Crosby's character that don't come true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they get overthrown, <laughs> and then they become so successful that Danny Kaye's character. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't remember any of the character names. I don't remember the character yeah. names either. Um, but Danny Kaye's character is like, oh my god, he needs to find a wife so that he yep. will stop working so incessantly, yep. so that I can have. Have like at least 48 hours off yeah. right to myself because they were overbooked and they were way too successful for, for danny k's yeah, character for danny k's character and so he guilt trips bing crosby into going to help like the haynes sisters or whatever under the pretense that the haynes sisters were sisters of this private mm-hmm. that they were in the war with right <laughs> there's a lot of things like and this is you know very what, what was the year of this movie? 1950? 1954. 54. Yeah. Okay. So around this time from the 40s and into the 50s, there was also a genre called screwball comedy, mm. um, which is still a genre, but it was it was a big thing in the early studios. Mm-hmm. You know, you get films like, you know, with uh, Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn mm-hmm. and these very fast dialogue things. There's, there's always some misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. There's some element where some kind of misunderstanding leads everything astray. Someone's idea about something or someone can't confront something. And then it kind of leads to this whole series of events. And eventually, you know, they're going to come back together in the mm-hmm. end. But I thought this it was interesting because it is a musical, but it also had heavy screwball elements. Yeah. It's so, so the screwball element here is a series of <laughs> misunderstandings mm-hmm. or um, contrivances mm-hmm. to get these things mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of silly. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, you know, it's a lighthearted film. And and so the other one mm-hmm. is that Danny Kaye and... Vera Ellen. Vera Ellen are going to scheme to get them back to... There's a misunderstanding of why... Help me explain it. Okay. So Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney, who is actually... She's like the aunt of George Clooney, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney's character, they end up falling in love and kissing. Obviously, we all saw that happening. We all saw that coming, right? Because Bing Crosby, I think, takes to her... like It was like love at first sight. And so... Yeah. That's what drove him. They see them perform Mm -hmm. at this performance, and then all of a sudden, oh, her eyes are so Mm -hmm. a beautiful brown. No, her eyes are a beautiful blue. They're looking at the Mm -hmm. and kind of falling in love and on sight. Both of them, I think. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, but the center conflict, or you know, whatever contrived thing of the plot, is that we got to get Bing Crosby to get married or to fall in love so that he will stop working. Right. So that's the the that's the event that leads everything in motion. And so they end up going to Vermont 
to follow the Hain sisters because they were supposed to perform at a ski resort in Vermont.、Mm-hmm. Except that they get there and they find out that there's no snow, so there are no ski lodgers and nobody to perform to. And then and the also, the owner of the place、yes. is the ex commanding officer of both. The general, yeah. It just happens to be a coincidence.、Yes. <laughs> so, coincidences are also part of the screwball element. Absolutely. Yeah. They are struggling. So, Bing Crosby and Danny Kay decide to stay and help him by producing this New York level vaudeville monstrosity show mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at the ski lodge in Vermont in order to attract customers, right? Right. And so, the snow is the impending Christmas miracle. Yes. Right? And. <laughs> In the process of producing the snow, the,、uh, not, not the snow, not the show, <laughs>、uh-huh. Bing Crosby's character gives Rosemary Clooney's character the impression that he is doing out of pure, he is doing this out of pure, like, right. Love and you know, respect towards the general, and then there's a let's just say there's a misunderstanding, yeah. And then there's a huge misunderstanding about, and then she thinks that he's doing it for his own profit, yeah, right. Danny Kaye's character and Vera Ellen's character decide to fake an engagement to each other、mm-hmm. so that. Her sister would feel more comfortable hooking up with Bing Crosby's character.、Yeah. And so, this poor aunt of George Clooney person <laughs> is very flustered and she goes back to New York to take a and job. And he has on her to go、own. back and get her. And then eventually, she sees that, oh, he was just promoting it for the general's benefit.、Mm-hmm. And then it's a tearful moment. Yeah. And then they go back to Vermont to do this show together. Yes. And it was very, like, a touching,、mm-hmm. schmaltzy moment. And then they have snow on Christmas Eve. Of course、yeah. they do. And then they sing White Christmas. Yeah. So White Christmas is sung at the be- very beginning of the film、mm-hmm. when they are soldiers. In the middle of you know, wherever they are, Italy or Germany or France、mm-hmm. or wherever. And it's kind of like a moment of longing.、Mm-hmm. And then he sings White Christmas.、Mm-hmm. And then at the end,、mm-hmm. they put on this elaborate show、mm-hmm. for the ski lodge.、Yep. It's basically combining the two talents together into one big show. And、mm-hmm. they pull all their friends together and、mm-hmm. all of their collaborators together to put on this massive show.、Mm-hmm. And then, miracle of miracles, it、mm-hmm. starts to snow.、Mm-hmm. And then he sings, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. So we sound like we hated this movie, but we didn't. But I think the contrived elements are just part of the screwball element exactly, of 1950.、Yeah. It's just funny to think of in a, in, a, in a historical sense. And that's kind of the enjoyment of these movies. But let's talk about some of the things that are performative in the movie.、Mm-hmm. Like, of course, the dancing is incredible. I think that Rosemary Clooney is known as a singer. So, this is purely based on like, their performances. I think that Vera Ellen is primarily a dancer. Very nice legs. Yes.、Um, and Rosemary Clooney is primarily a singer. I'm saying this because back in the day when studios used to like, own actors, right? Yeah, yeah. This is Paramount Studios,、mm-hmm. by the way. And at this time, every studio was competing to have their own.、Right. Musicals were popular, and every studio had its own kind of stars. They basically had to do everything, but then, you know, everybody. Kind of had their specialty. So, if、mm. you, even if you're a dancer, you have to sing and you have to obviously act. Yeah. But I think I can tell that Vera Ellen was obviously like a supreme dancer. Dancer. Yeah,、McDancer. she was amazing. Yes, and kind of person. And she was performing just insanely、mm-hmm. precisely choreographed numbers,、mm-hmm. showcasing different styles of contemporary dance、mm. and ballet, tap dancing, like all yeah, kinds of、yeah. shit she was doing. Like it was like almost a circus level performance、mm-hmm. and rhythm and all that.、Mm-hmm. And so that really just sort of like took my breath away. I think she was a bit of a scene stealer. She was. Because I know what Bing Crosby sounds like. Yeah. You know? But I was really, really. Really、impressed by her performance.、Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's impressive too, Danny Kay, because、uh, I don't know very much about him, but、mm-hmm. I think he's sort of a jack of all trades kind of guy. Yeah. And he was genuinely funny. He was. I think I turned to you at one point and said, he feels contemporary. Yeah, like he feels、yeah. like, you know, he could land yeah, yeah. in today yeah, and, yeah. and he would be funny. Absolutely. Very much a slapstick element,、mm-hmm. but, a, you know, capable dancer, really, you know,、mm-hmm. really good performances with Vera Lynn. I keep wanting to say Vera, Vera Lynn. Ellen. Vera Ellen. Vera Ellen. 
I thought Rosemary Clooney held her own against uh, Bing Crosby. Not that there needs to be a holding your own. I thought they sang really well together. Oh, they sang beautifully together. Yeah, I think that's probably voice. why she was cast, mm. because her voice blended so seamlessly with him, because he was probably cast at first. I mean, let's face it. Yeah, it yeah, probably sure. a movie well, that was probably around... Paramount probably yeah. said, we'll do it if Bing Crosby does it. Yeah, it was probably a, a, a movie written around Bing Crosby, I think. Mm. I think Bing Crosby's White Christmas was the number one selling Christmas album of all time, if wow. I'm not mistaken, even surpassing Mar- Mariah Carey. <laughs> well, now we have to give props to the writer. Mm-hmm. Is it Irving Berlin? Yes. Irving Berlin. Yeah. Very well-known yeah. songwriter. And I think the song was written in the 1930s, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. So because it wasn't I, I... written for the movie. Oh, okay. You're looking on the internet now, Yes, because I need to get this right. You're cheating. No, we I... We don't do research on this show. Yeah, but this is a really important... Okay. Detail. I'm very. I'm. I'm really, really weird about songs and songwriters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Do, uh, White do... Christmas is an Irving Berlin song reminiscing about an old-fashioned Christmas setting. The song was written by Berlin for the musical film Holiday Inn. So it was written for another oh. musical film. Interesting. Released in 1942. And all of you sleuths who are now interested in how this older movie became White Christmas can go ahead and look that up on the internet, and we'll talk about other things. Okay, so since its release, White Christmas has been covered by multiple artists, Mm -hmm. with the version sung by Bing Crosby being the world's best-selling single in terms of sales of physical media. Oh. So... So everybody got the 45. Yeah. And they would, you know, for Christmas, Mm -hmm. and they would play it. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a great and, tune. It's a great oh little tune. Oh my God. And you know what? Bing Crosby is kind of a funny, like a normal looking dude, right? He, he looked like a normal middle-aged dude. Mm-hmm. Should we body shame him? No, I'm not going to body shame him. Like, I don't think we should go into details of okay. why he was a funny looking man. <laughs> but he's a, he's a normal, like he's a yeah, very... Yeah, he's a normal looking dude. Yeah, normal looking dude. And as soon as he starts singing, though, yeah. he's like... Oh, okay. That is not. He's no- the center of yeah, the room. He's no normal dude. Like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and his voice was truly exceptional. And mm-hmm. I realized this. I was like, "What? There's nobody who sounds like that." And I right. don't know what it is. It's like this deep, velvety. Yeah, it's very velvety. Oh, That's gosh. why I thought him and Rosemary Clooney together just matched. And so well. she definitely held her own. Like she was, you yeah. know, her voice was very deep and velvety too. Right. And it, she was like the female version of mm-hmm. Bing Crosby. And so their duets were beautiful yeah they were and there were these quartet songs too right yeah they they just pull all this talent together really mm-hmm. well and there's like a series of different numbers mm-hmm. in different combinations mm-hmm. we see the two men do their thing mm-hmm. their their kind of variety their vaudeville was i don't know not that great not mm-hmm. that <laughs> impressive i didn't think and then the same with the girls i thought the sisters their vaudeville wasn't all that great yeah because um, it was the show within the show it was the, right it yeah. was the show within the show which maybe had to be kind of yeah. You know, average, I guess. Yeah. They had to be lacking in order for the four of them to come together and produce like a grand. And then yeah. when they fu- the four of them got yeah. together, everything took on this hugely grand mm-hmm. scale. Yes. Movies about music. Yeah, for me, like White Christmas, when I think of Christmas time mm-hmm. and the nostalgia of Christmas, mm-hmm. really there's two for me. There's The Carpenters mm-hmm. and there's Bing Crosby. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I'd say Tony Bennett mm-hmm. is in there too. But Bing and the Carpenters are the big ones for mm. me. That's that's what I think of as Christmas. Mm. And um, so it was nice to see this movie. Yeah, what else can we say about it? I'd like to give a weird shout out. If, Go. Yeah, okay. And I, this isn't a shout out. Like me mentioning him will not affect him whatsoever, obviously. Nobody's going to listen to this. And Don't be sell able. the pod short. <laughs> But do you know who Michael Bublé is? Michael Bublé, I don't. <laughs> Bublé. A oh, Bublé. Is a Canadian crooner who does mostly, he does all the Christmas specials now. So he does, mm-hmm. like, he, he's continuing the tradition of these crooner type of, like, Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, kind of like Tony Bennett type of singing, right? Okay. He's crooner singing. He's not as good as any of them. Let's get this straight, right? He's no Sinatra. He's no Tony Bennett. But I love him so dearly for continuing this tradition because I feel like the world needs more crooners. I'm sorry. If you are a male singer out there, consider singing the American Songbook. I don't Mm. know why it's not done anymore as 
much as it yeah, should? Yeah, yeah. Or does the world only have room for one crooner, and that's Michael Bublé? I, I feel know. like in in my knowledge of crooners, which is very small, hmm. Harry Connick Jr. was the last crooner we had. See, I don't. I'm not a fan of Harry Connick Jr. I like his voice. I don't think he his singing is really on par with all the other crooners. Like he doesn't have the showmanship. Like he's a little grumpy too. And I, I don't, don't really like, pay close attention. I just you know I've heard him sing and I like his voice. He's a great musician, but I think there's something grumpy about him that I don't like. And mm. I I like my crooners suave. <laughs> And very charming, you right, know? <laughs> right, 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 right. And I, if you are a charming and suave, like a tall glass of water, mm-hmm. and you can sing, mm-hmm. consider being a crooner, because okay. the world needs more crooners, I mm-hmm. feel like. There are a lot of, like, female jazz singers who, mm-hmm. you know, do the Jessica Rabbit thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe our friend Gino could be a crooner. We, yeah, forgot, we forgot to mention that one of the other recordings we did, <laughs> yes. in addition to the jingle that we recorded, mm-hmm. we recorded a Christmas song mm-hmm. on Sunday. Yes. That was fun. And we recorded, what's the name of the song? Fairy Tale of New York, originally by the Pogues. Which is the most politically incorrect Absolutely. Christmas song yeah. you've ever heard in your life. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an Irish 3-4, I guess you'd call it a jig kind mm-hmm. of feel. It's, it's beautifully inappropriate. And it's beautiful. And I wish I could play it for you guys for the closing mm-hmm. credits, but we can't because of copyright mm-hmm. reasons, right? But we will, you know, probably put it up on YouTube or oh, Bandcamp. Yeah. yeah, we'll put it yeah. up on YouTube or Bandcamp. Mm-hmm. And, and I have to say, <laughs> listening to Gino and Cece sing together mm-hmm. is like a Disney movie. <laughs> Because Gino was in He was character. totally in character. Yeah. He was this weird, like he transformed into this toxic male. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you rose to the occasion. You're all of a sudden this Irish girl. Mm-hmm. like Because, yeah. you know, your style of singing, you're obviously, you're a beautiful singer, but you were having, I think, some problems with the staccato Irish oh, sure. thing yeah, at yeah. first. But then you caught on and then you were kind of like matching Gino's. So it sounds like I am this lassie who lost totally. her innocence to Gino <laughs> yeah. upon arriving to New York mm-hmm. <laughs> under false pretenses. And it totally sounds like that, right? <laughs> it does. It does. I, I'm really happy the way it came out. I We recorded it and I'm going to mix mm-hmm. it and put it together. So we'll we'll find a place on YouTube for that or, yeah. or Bandcamp or something <laughs> And like Gino that. Brand Soundcloud. sounds crazy. Like he what? doesn't, he sounds crazy good in, yeah. in, char- in yeah. this whatever character. Yeah, he sounds saying. pretty toxic, doesn't he? <laughs> It sounds like a total But he sounds creep. great. Like he, he like that's great. what made me think of the crooner yeah. thing. Or the crooner thing made me think of Gino. <laughs> um but yeah, that was that was really fun. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll get that out. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our first movie about music that's gonna be that is a musical and we'll probably do more. Mm-hmm. I can think of some others. Yeah. The backstage musical. Yeah. And that tick tick boom movie came out. That's right. So we're going to do that one yeah. later. Mm-hmm. I think next week we are going to do... La double the... vie de Véronique. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess we can sneak ahead. The other one that we've been wanting to do, which I think is good for kind of a holiday season. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but the fabulous Baker Boys. We're oh, you know do... why it's good for the holiday why? season? Because it's about a New Year's Eve gig. Oh, maybe we should do that instead of... <laughs> La double vie de Véronique. Yeah, we're going to push yeah. that one back, I guess, <laughs> okay. again. Okay, so we'll do, we'll probably do yeah. um, The Fabulous Baker Boys. Yeah, next. I think that's a great idea. Okay, good. And that's it for now. Mm-hmm. Please, um, we still don't have any reviews. Mm-hmm. Should I say that? <laughs> we're, I'm begging for like just one review. Somebody yeah. please review our podcast. Yeah. But it really does help to get us, you know, some attention. And mm-hmm. We would like to... You know, we're attention horse just like everybody else. <laughs> and we have an Instagram account at Movies About Music where you can complain about what you heard. <laughs> That's right. On the comment section. And please do. Please, mm-hmm. please call out our errors, which are probably many. Is it okay to say Merry Christmas? Yeah, totally. This yeah. is a Christmas movie. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Mm-hmm. And I hope you have a very healthy and safe and joyous holiday season. Yes. Bye bye. Under the moonlight I'll sing you a song So you'd magically feel a love that's alone Hopefully they'll live eternally If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war of immeasurable pain, unconditional love, movie.
is about music.